heaven in Genesis chapter 3. Have your notes out. Okay, where we left off in Genesis 3, verse 7. So what is the condition that the man and woman are were in when we left off? They were naked. The woman had eaten from the fruits. And then what? So they so then they, they found out that they were naked, and what did they make clothing out of? Big leaves. Okay. Not that's not very good clothing. That there's a there's a symbolic meaning of the fig leaves there. We'll get to that later. What I want to begin by talking about is the serpent. So a few things about the serpent. Since, since the serpent is the one who tempted the woman, and the woman, as we'll learn today, the woman says she was beguiled by the serpent. Okay, so let's talk about the serpent. H-E-B is Hebrew. In Hebrew, the serpent is called Ha-Nakash. Ha-Nakash. And as with uh, many other Hebrew words and other Semitic words, similar things, this, this word can mean different things simultaneously. Okay? De depending sometimes on pronunciation, how you divide the word. So Hanakash, you know, we translate it for a reason as serpent. It can be a serpent. Okay, but and the kosh can also be a diviner. You know what that is? Someone who practices divinization. Not divinization, divination. Divinization is becoming like God. Someone who practices divination. You know what that means? This means something like a fortune teller. Someone who can predict the future, read your fortune, something like that. It also means shining one. So you, you see in how this is not simply a snake. Okay? Called a serpent, a nakash. But there's more going on here, of course, because this creature has an intellect very advanced intellect. It outsmarts, we could say, uh, what the woman, and through extension, because the woman gives to the man to eat the same fruit. What I want you to do, we're going to do something a little different here. If you, so the handy thing about these Bibles are you have these little tabs. You can put a tab here in Genesis 3. And what I want you to do is turn to the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation and go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12, 9. Revelation is the very last book of the Bible. So you want to take a big handful of pages. If you don't know where Revelation is, toward the end. <laughs> We're all using the same Bible so I can do this. I'm not normally going to do this through the year. But it's page 1703. Remember, you don't want to rely on page numbers because uh, not everybody's always using the same Bible. We happen to be using the same Bible, page 1703. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Does anyone know who wrote the book of Revelation? Any idea? It's one of the apostles. It's credited to the apostle John. Written approximately 100, 95 to 100 AD, so end of the first century. Why am I having you look here? If you look at verse 9 in Revelation 12, the serpent is called, if you read, and the great dragon, called a dragon, and the ancient serpent is also called what? What two titles? Devil and Satan. So I want you to have this in your notes, Revelation 12, 9. The serpent is also called devil and Satan. Okay. The devil, diabolos, means, can mean liar, divider. We'll call it, we'll call it the slanderer. Someone who lies about you. 
in a very violent, a very particular way. Someone who slanders. It slander is a lie. It causes division. Satan in Hebrew, Hasatan, means the accuser. Okay, so these titles, devil and Satan, are used throughout the Bible. This is the final book of the Bible in the book of Revelation, and this is the first time that these two titles are put together. Now we know as Christians, we, we commonly say, like, well, Satan is the devil, the devil is Satan. We use those interchangeably. This is the first time in the Bible that those two words are used, like the devil, capital D, and the Satan, capital S. So you'll, so you'll see in the gospel where Jesus casts out devils, what we would call demons. And in the 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 word Satan is a title used, we'll see it other places in the Old Testament, where this spiritual being called the Satan actually seems to assist God, performs a certain function for God. So you'll see that, for instance, when we get to the book of Job. If you're familiar with the story of Job at all, yeah. Satan, yeah. the Satan accuses Job, and then really what Satan does is tests Job's faith by giving all these horrible things to Job, doing all these horrible things to him, to see how strong he is. Okay. By the time we get to the New Testament, which we'll see later, you have this this figure is known as the Satan. Like there's one of them, and he's all bad. All bad. So what John is saying here, if you read in Genesis, which let's turn back to Genesis 3, what John is saying here is even though Genesis doesn't say that this with this, that's what this serpent is, this Nakash, what he's saying is. This is what this being is. And this is what we find out about him through time. It's the devil and Satan. So I've, I've, blo I've blocked that off. I want you to have that in your notes. This The, the Hanukkah, the serpent, is known in the book of Revelation as the devil and Satan. All right, let's continue on. We're not going to get through all of chapter 3 today. If you look at verse 8, let me read. let me read a few verses here. Again, just follow along. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, etc. We'll get to that. So a couple of things here, uh, what's important. If you look beginning at chapter, excuse me, beginning at verse 8, what is God pictured as doing at the beginning of verse 8? What is God pictured doing right, right away? Walking. Okay, so let's put a couple of things down. God is walking. And then what does God start to do? God says, what's the first thing he says? What's the first thing God says? Where are you? And then, et cetera, et cetera. Adam says, I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? Uh, because I'm, you know, why are you hiding? Uh, who told you you were naked? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. God is asking what? God is asking what? What do we call these? There's a little punctuation. Questions. Is is that a big deal? Well, that's not something that you would think God would have to do, right? 
if he knows everything, if he's all powerful, if he's everywhere, why is he asking questions? Okay, he should already know exactly what happened. In fact, God knew all this before it happened. So why is he asking questions? Let's see if there be truth. So one thing there, yeah. So one thing there is that's a good point to to bring to to get them to elicit the truth. I'll do that myself with some of my children. I already know what they did, and I already know it was wrong. I know exactly everything. But I'll say, what did you do? And then I'm going to see if they're going to lie to me or not. Why? Because it's important to own up to what you've done wrong. If someone just said, you did, boo, it's important to take responsibility. Yes. It's important to take responsibility for what you've done. But I'm going to give you a, a, a long word here. I want you to put it in your notes. One of the things that's happening here is what we call anthropomorphizing. Anthropomorphizing. Have any of you heard that word? Anthropomorphization, anthropomorphizing. Okay. You see the you see the uh, the prefix here, the meaning word anthro, like anthropology. That means like man, like human. Morph means to change. It's a, so what this means when you it's it's a literary tool, literary device. What this means is giving human qualities to non-humans, non-human things, not just something that's not human, giving it human qualities. So the writer here, the inspired writer, is anthropomorphizing God. Why would the writer anthropomorphize God? Well, what this does, so what we know from this story in a real way is God somehow communicated with the man and the woman. How this happens, we don't know. If you've ever thought, some of you probably have, God spoke to me or God was speaking to me or I got a message from God. It's not normally like you hear my voice. Hey, go do this or don't do that. Or I need you to pray for this person. Something like that. It's intuition. It's emotion. It's it's all these things. When God speaks directly to you, it's not like I'm speaking to you. Okay. So what the what the inspired writer is doing here is is putting this in terms that are easy to understand. He's representing something that's very true in a way that the reader can understand it. Um, <clears throat> that's number one. Okay, we often see this. There's other stories. Can you think of any? There's tons of them. Can you think of a another story or movie that that uses anthropomorphization, like makes something non-human gives it human qualities? The sun. The sun. Okay, the sun is that is isn't there a baby in the sun in the Teletubbies? Yeah, that's not real. In case you didn't know. Other things like just pick one at random. The Lion King. What's going on there? The ocean and the, uh, the animal. I never saw Moana, but what does the ocean do? Doesn't it has personality? It communicate? Yeah, good. Anything. Uh, I saw half of Moana, but the sound was off. I think I got enough. I don't know. It was my daughter's ballet class. They had to play. So yeah, like that. Any any Disney movie where there's talking animals and they're doing all this stuff. That's not what animals do. Okay. That's anthropomorphizing because children like that, even in uh, what's the like Beauty and the Beast. You ever seen that one? The, te the teapot talks and the candle talks. There's probably a toilet in there that talks. I don't know. So they all, the things talk. That's not real. It's anthropomorphizing things. Why? Humans like that. We like, we're humans and we like humans and we like things to be like humans and we relate to things that way. Okay. So sometimes, I mean, it's, it's not that's harmless unless you really think if you go out in the wilderness and you see a bear, that bear does not want to be your friend or have tea with you or get to know you. It doesn't have a pocket watch. The bear will kill you. Okay. So that's not, so you, you, you see what's going on. It's a literary device. That's number one. This happens all through the, the Old Testament. And even in the New Testament, we have to. Because our intellects are limited, you have to understand God in that way. So we sometimes have to give God 
human traits or qualities. God is walking. Does God have feet or legs? No. Now, in the incarnation with Jesus Christ, he does, but that's a human nature. Okay? So there's some other stuff going on there, but that's anthropomorphizing. The second thing that's going on here is the writer shows God's intimacy with the man and woman. And in a... And oddly enough, is vulnerability. What does that mean? So you see, you see what God is doing here. So imagine yourself. Uh, let's say you had, let's say you had two really good friends. You're two really good friends, and every day, so it pictures God here as like taking a walk in the garden. So the idea here is, is like this was something they did every day. He shows up. So imagine you have two really, you have two really good friends. And every day at 6 p.m., uh, you met them to, you, you took a walk and, and talked with them, okay? It's something like older people don't do, but it's a nice thing to do. You, you, you met your friends, and you walked and had a discussion, okay? You had that closeness. You did that every day. So one day you show up at 6 p.m., show up at a normal spot, and they're not there. They didn't tell you where they're going to be. They're both missing. Um, so you're going to be, you might show up, you want to make sure they're not, well, I don't know why they'd be hiding from, why would they be hiding from you? But you want, where are you? Are you here? You know, you know, blah, 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 blah. Are you here? And then you hear a voice. I'm over here. Why are you hiding? Well, I heard you coming. And I, in this case, I was naked, but I heard you. Coming. What is going on there? It's hard to get from the tech. It's difficult, but you gotta, you gotta put yourself in the, what this does by giving God feet and legs and giving God this, it's something real going on where you can actually put yourself in God's shoes. Imagine your disappointment. Imagine the hurt you feel. Okay? This happens to people, let's say you, let's say you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, and every day you might text them, and at a certain time of day, you're used to talking on the phone to them, and then you call them, and they don't pick up. And then they don't pick up. And then later they call you, but they're acting weird. They don't want to talk to you. What's going on there? They're going to break up with you. Or maybe they just do it. Okay. And it's awkward, but it hurts. That's the, that's the reason a lot of people will, they don't want to, they don't want to, uh, they don't want to have any emotional attachment to someone. They don't want to get close to someone because there's, the, there's a danger there. The danger is that person can, we use the phrase, break your heart. The person can hurt you. If everyone's just a stranger or a coworker or a classmate or whatever, you keep them apart, you, f you feel safe because you're not going to, you know, they can't emotionally hurt you or they, you're not vulnerable. But you also will never experience love, intimate love, self-giving. So every time you you give your heart to someone, I'll use that kind of language. Every time you're that you are have that relationship with someone, there's a mutual exchange, but there's also a mutual vulnerability. This is the, to us, it might be like, yeah, what's the big deal? In the ancient world, if you know anything about ancient gods and goddesses, if you've ever heard of like the Epic of Gilgamesh. Or you know anything about the Greek or Roman gods or any any of the gods? Okay, did they make themselves vulnerable to to mortals? Not normally. If they did become vulnerable, it was like there was a trick, and then you could kill them. You could do something to hurt them. But I mean, emotionally vulnerable. No. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the gods want to destroy humanity because humans are too loud. You know, make it too much noise down there, we're gonna flood you. In, in the in the Greek and Roman myths and other myths, like they 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 have they're very petty. Like Apollo might wipe out your army because you worshipped another god over him. They play tricks. Zeus plays tricks, all these gods. The reason you offer sacrifice to a god is so they don't smite you, they don't flood your city. Or you want them to kill your enemies, and they'll do it. That's the idea that's working there. In this story, it's different. You have one God, all-powerful, creates everything, creates male and female to be in a partnership with them, but also has a friendship with them, communicates with them, and in this way is hurt 
by what they do. So we use we we can use the human terms like hurt and vulnerable. That's what's going on there. That's why God's asking questions. That's why God's walking in the garden because he wants to meet his friends. He's got this partnership with them and now they've betrayed him. Okay, so let's keep going there. When God asks, have you eaten of the tree? Of course, he already knows. But have you eaten of the tree I commanded you not to? You can imagine a disappointment. Why did you? Why would you do this? Why, why have you eaten of the tree? Who does Adam blame? Or the man blames. He asked the man first. The man blames the woman. We can just call them Adam and Eve because we learned that. Adam blames Eve. Does Eve take the blame? Who does she blame? The serpent. Who does the serpent blame? No one. He's just sitting there. Stand there. Whatever. You know, you got me. You know. What I want you to see here, so you can you can draw this, or recreate this, or just get the picture in your notes. When you have the good order of creation. So let's have good order. Who's at the top? Who's supposed to be the boss? Who's supposed to have the authority? God. So you have God. Who does God create first? In the in the second chapter of Genesis. It doesn't mention angels. So angels are somewhere in there, but the man. Let's just call him Adam. Because that's the name, the Adam. Okay? And then he takes from his side, from man comes woman, who is given at the end of Genesis 3, is given the name Eve. There's a partnership there. Okay? They have different roles. Adam came first. The woman came from him. Adam has a certain role, Eve, but they're, they're male and female. He created them. There's 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 a partnership. So they're, they're here. And then who does who does the man name? Who does the man get to name? Did we write? The animals. The animal kingdom. Okay? And so part of this group the Nakash, even though we just said it's more than just a snake, it's still depicted as one of the, the animals. Okay. That's how it's supposed to be. Now, what did I say? If you remember back, and we'll, we'll get toward the end of wrapping this up for today. If you remember back uh, to the beginning, I said, what was the condition that the, the uh, earth appears to be in. With, without form and void, starts with the sea, what do we call that? Chaos. Chaos. So, what one of the things the Nakash here is doing is reintroducing chaos. Now there's going to be a new order. Who gives, who gives the commands here? Who does the woman listen to? The serpent has placed himself at the top. And then who did he who did he communicate directly with? Eve, the woman, we'll call her Eve. That's her name she's given. Who eats from Eve's hand? Adam. Adam. And then who's left out of the picture? Who shows up and says, Where you know, it's like, where's God? Okay. This is called chaos. It's also called in version inverted hierarchy the serpent who we learn later is the devil satan the liar is at the top god created man in his image male and female he created them satan the serpent the demon the devil cannot create but what he do what he can do is twist okay he can transform twist in a bad way there's a movie called, I didn't even see it yet. I just know there's a part, but I saw someone quote it. There's a movie called Nefarious that came out not that long ago. It's about a demonic possession and things like that. I, I heard it's good. I got I still have watched it. But in the movie, there's like demons speaking through a man, and they say, I'm paraphrasing, God created you in his image, and we recreated you in ours. Okay. The devil can't create, but what the devil can do is kind of reshape if you allow him to do. That's what he wants to do. So you got the serpent at the top. This is disorder. You no longer even have a partnership. You have 
the man taking from the hand of the woman and having nothing to say about it, it's backwards. And then God's gone. You see that in the garden, and what you see in any society that has an inverted hierarchy, it's not just that people lose faith. It's not just that people put God beneath other things. They start to even think God doesn't exist. If you want to, if you want to have one of the, there's different ways. One of the telltale signs of an unhealthy society is the rise of atheism and agnosticism. It's just un, it's it's un, it's unhealthy for everybody. It means lower participation in civic affairs, lower participation in organized religion, less trust. What do you, if if you don't believe in God? What does that mean for your life? You have to give your life meaning. That might be cool for you if you're born in the right kind of place and you have maybe enough money and security. I can I can give myself meaning. You know, I can accomplish things. I have friends. I'm healthy. I have pets. I'll give my life meaning. What if you're born in a war zone or you're, or you're hungry all the time or you're born with no legs or you're blind? You're going to give yourself a ton of meaning there? No. Okay. And the state for the majority of humans in the world is not what most of us enjoy, which is relative peace and security and other stability. We all have trials, but if you compare the average person here to the average person in some uh, war-torn country, okay, you see the difference. You can't, you can't give yourself that meaning. You can't give meaning to your life. And so if you lose God, what you lose is meaning, purpose. You begin to think humans are just an accident. You could, We could all just have easily not have existed. My life is an accident. I could have easily not have existed. If someone's born or not, doesn't matter. Okay? There's no purpose. You're just supposed to do what you want to do and get what you want to get, whatever. Okay? You can be nice if you want or not. Who cares? That's what happens here. So God gets left out of the picture. So the rest of the Bible is going to be a restoration mission to flip this back around. And so, as we said before, who's the new Adam? And who's the new Eve? Mary. And as we'll see, I gave you at the beginning of the year, it's called the Proto-Evangelium. Genesis 3.15, we'll cover that again uh, next week. But back under their feet is the serpent. That's called, that, that's called a healthy society. That's called Christianity. That's called restoration. The danger is it can always get flipped. And even if not for everybody, this happens in your own life. You got to watch things don't get flipped on your head. I'm going to close there next. I won't be here uh, for your class Monday. You'll have a substitute, so you have some kind of assignment. We'll conclude Genesis 3 on Tuesday. We'll talk about the curses that God gives. He names Eve, etc. Okay? Close your Bibles and pass them forward, please.